She saw her daughter in a dream, being punished, being tortured, in a pit of darkness and fire. She was so upset, she went to Hassan and Bafi, uh, to Malik ibn Dinar. Malik ibn Dinar said, go and pray to Hajjun every night and make dua for her. Anyway, here we go. What I want to talk to you today about is this book. Everyone's got this. You got to get this book. This is one of the, the best books you're ever going to get. I'm telling you. Because it's all about life after death. Now, the most important thing after belief in Allah and His messages is you got to believe in life after death, right? Because that's essentially what most people, they're, uh, the reason we do things or not do things is because of belief in life after death. And that's so important. It's so important to have this iman that we're going to meet Allah afterwards. After you believe in that, a lot of tensions, they go away. A lot of concerns, a lot of nervousness, it all goes away once a person stops believing in life after, or starts believing and remembering. And it's a dhikr. This is not natural. It's not a natural thing to think about akhirah. It has to be done on purpose. It's got to be sort of manufactured within you. There are a lot of things about life that are not natural. I mean, love of Allah and His Messenger, uh, I think that love of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is something natural about it. You know that this universe has a maker. You look at everything in the world divided into two categories, natural and synthetic. Of course, everything is the creation of Allah, but when we look at things, everything in the world is either natural or it's synthetic. So uh, this iPad, for example, is synthetic. It's, it's made by a person, by human beings. And then you have, look at the trees behind me, it's natural. Natural things are always more superior than synthetic things. Number one, okay, they reproduce. They reproduce themselves. Synthetic things don't reproduce themselves. You buy an iPad, then Apple's going to you know, start uh, put out another iPad. You've got to get that. The whole technology goes, is out. You're going to be getting something completely different uh, in 10 years, right? The cars, you get a car, it starts devaluating right away. You get a horse, though. Well, you need two horses. They're going to reproduce, right? So nat the natural things, they produce themselves. They reproduce, okay? Num natural things are free. Allah doesn't charge you for the sun because he has no need. Synthetic things, man-made things, always come at a price because human beings are weak. That's why natural uh, man-made things, they have a price because we need money, right? We need wealth, etc. Uh the, the uh, things of nature, Allah doesn't need anything from us. He's just given it to us for free. All right? Allah is more loving. And the ubudiyah of Allah, the being a slave to Allah, we receive His benefits. We profit from Him. He doesn't profit from us. But human beings, we profit from each other. All right? If you can't buy it, they're not making it for you. And if you can't pay for it, they're not selling it to you. All right? Natural things are all interconnected. Whereas synthetic things are not. And that's how we know the maker of, of this world is one. Because the atmosphere connects with the hydrosphere, right? It evaporates water from the ocean. That water goes up, gets purified in the atmosphere. It goes up salt water, it comes down. Natural, pure water that you could drink, if not for uh, acid rain, right? But it's something that is all connected. It comes down into the soil. And in that soil, right, it, it, it benefits the soil. Right? It could have gone, the soil could be something that doesn't benefit from water. Right? Like uh, a lot of materials don't benefit from water. But Allah made the earth, covered it with soil that benefits from water. Number one, it purifies water. And number two, things can grow and it can be a home for things. And that's the geosphere, the rocks and the soil. And then who benefits from that? The biosphere. The deers, the chickens, the human beings, we eat from these things. Right? So everything is connected and that's how we know the maker of this world. Number one, because... Nature is superior to man-made things and synthetically made things. We know that the maker of this world must be superior in all of his attributes than the maker of synthetic things. In the same way that you would never believe that a chicken can make an iPad. Or that a rock right, uh, could make a dam, a beaver's dam. Or that a tree could make a nest because they don't have the ability. Likewise, we don't have the ability to make nature. To create nature. So the creator of nature must be greater right, in all of his attributes than the creator of synthetic things. Furthermore, the creator of nature must be only one because everything's interconnected. Even far out, the sun and the moon and everything else is all interconnected. 
So belief in Allah Ta'ala, you can sort of say just by fitrah, we can accept, we know that we have a maker. And there's compassion in the creation, right? Just by thinking about it, you will know that there's compassion. Everything's free. Everything comes back to life. Everything heals. That's the sign of love of the creation, uh, of the creator for his creation. Okay? Things heal. Things come back to life. Things are beautiful. Things are free. Things are warm. All right? So we have all that. Love of the Prophet ﷺ is something that is not a natural thing that you would just think of. It has to be something that is transmitted to you, then you believe it, and then you do something to earn it, then Allah creates it inside of your heart. In the same vein, thought of life after death, which is what this book is about, and I highly recommend that everyone gets this, okay? That it's all about life in the grave, not the afterlife, just life in the grave. Okay, we've got to go to the grave first before we go to the afterlife. That the idea that uh, we think about the afterlife is something that it's not natural to us. We have to actually imbibe it within us and physically we have to try to do it. In the same way that growing muscles is not something natural, right? Growing a stomach is natural because you love to eat, you're going to get fat, right? But growing muscles and being physically fit is unnatural. Growing hair is natural. Cleaning your hair is unnatural. Meaning it's, it's something that has to be taught, right? And we have to be taught this. And the author of this book, he, his impetus of writing it, his name is, uh, uh, he, he actually doesn't put his name on it, he translated it. His name is Mahdi Lak. His name is uh, not on the cover out of his humility, but uh, his name is Mahdi Lak. He puts his, the, his name in the inside cover, not on the outside cover. But what happened was that he lost his mother-in-law, and as a result, the whole family was really just thinking about death. And he came upon this book. And this happens to all of us. All of us, Right? At some point or other, you're going to lose a loved one. In the last podcast, I talked about how I lost, I've only lost one person close to me in my whole life. Like, of course, I lost my wife's grandparents, who I knew and loved, but you know, they're, grand, they're actually great grandparents, right? Or grandparents, sorry. But someone who I lived with intimately, I only lost one. And many of you probably have lost love, but I only lost one, which is my best friend. And that happened when I was 19, he was 20. Okay, and he drowned in Italy doing a semester abroad. And when you think about death, when you experience the death of a mu'min, wallahi, this is the best reminder. It is the most amazing experience. And honestly, it's an amazing experience. To me, I never viewed it as a dark, negative thing. Right? I probably would have viewed it such if there was a trail of tears such as dependence. Right? When, when, a, when a mom or a dad dies, it's really... Because you think of the kids. And they got to go through life, and they're not going to have their uh, their mom there at the wedding. They're not going to have their dad there at their wedding, etc. But Allah takes care of them, and the community takes care of them, or Allah uses the community to take care of them. But when you think about when when there are no dependents, let's say an, an an elderly person dies, that experience of witnessing those deaths, it's to me, it's one of the most iman boosting experiences because we read about the afterlife all the time. And when you think that someone that you know, that you lived with, just went there, okay? their soul came out of their body. We don't know what that means. And it's a scary thing. If I was to pin you down right now and say, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to take a tooth out of your body, a tooth. What does Imam al-Ghazali in the alchemy of happiness say about pain? He says that pain, it only occurs where the body is connected to the soul. So that's why you can cut your hair and your nails, and you don't feel pain because it's not connected to the soul. So you only feel pain insofar as the body is connected to the soul. Okay? When we talk about this, imagine now the soul itself coming out. And al Ghazali says nobody talks about that pain because they're in so much pain that they can't talk, they can't even open their mouth. And yet for the mu'min, for the believer, it's like just plucking a flower or plucking a grape. Right? It's scary because someone's about to take your whole soul out, not something out of your body, your entire soul out. So it's a scary idea. And of everyone who's about to die and sees the medical moats coming is scared. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ لِلْمَوْتِ سَكَرَاتِ Even the Prophet ﷺ is saying that he experienced this nervousness at the soul being taken out. سكرات الموت This this scary part of death. But for the mu'min, the soul comes out very lightly. Right? And in fact, they may see images that are so beautiful. Uh, 
that they it's almost like a it's almost like uh, an anesthesia and they start looking forward to the world they're going to and go ask your grandparents and and see what they say and all of you okay um about people who died the righteous people who died they always tell you that they're seeing things okay they always say in england i was there there was a bengali woman and she was very old. She was dying. Her grandson was there at the deathbed, uh, uh, by her hos- uh, hospital bed. And he was reciting to her Yasin. And then after they finished Yasin, she started saying, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. She sat up and she was saying, La ilaha illallah, with such strength, although she was on her deathbed. I mean, she was really weak. But at that moment, she got up and she was saying, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And she was staring around the hospital bed. And some of these people have said that we saw that the roof of the building that they were in comes off. And they were just looking up. Right? We see a roof. They were seeing something. To- they were seeing the ghaib. What is ghaib to us? They were seeing it. Okay? And she started fervently saying, La ilaha illallah, over and over and over and over. All right? With such strength. And then she said, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she laid down. And he was like, subhanAllah, she just had this burst of energy. And then he was distracted. He was like telling his family that she had this burst of energy. And then suddenly he looked and she had passed away. So Allah Ta'ala, he never shocks a mu'min. And in as far as we treat Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with, with sincerity in this world, we're going to see that reward when we die at the moment of death. And it becomes, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, the greatest moment of our existence. That's why that podcast is called The Ultimate Experience. It becomes the greatest moment of your existence. Is the moment when all of the ikhlas that you put in this world, it, the, it, it, you get a feedback. You get paid back for that. You get the reward of that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَى الْإِحْسَانِ Someone who's uh, sincere. Isn't his reward going to be someone who gives goodness? Isn't his reward goodness? And how do we treat Allah? We treat Allah by our opinion of Him, number one. Our constant prayer to Him. Many people, they, they look for you know uh, sheets and stuff to do a lot of dhikr for their iman to go up. I'll tell you, what's going to take your iman up is dua. There is nothing like dua. And the generosity of dua, that you say that there, we all know that there are three possible responses to the dua. Either Allah gives us what we ask for, or he takes that dua and he forgives some sins, uh, or he gives us something in the akhirah uh, uh, as a compensation for it. Right? Now guess what? Here is the beauty of it. Any time that your mind tells you, oh, I might get this, might not get this, go back to your mind and tell yourself, Allah is generous. Listen to this. If you have sins, then the first portion of your dua Okay. If your du'a gets answered and you make du'a a hundred times, you get your du'a answered, that, is, that counts as one du'a answered. The other 99 du'as okay, that you made, half of them, they will all go to purify your sins. And if your sins are all cleaned, then they become reward for you on the afterlife. So what do you get? All three. So don't ever think that when they say that du'a... Uh, uh, you're going to get one of three things. No, you can get all three or two, okay? Or just one, right? But you could possibly get all three. If Allah answers that dua and you prayed for a year, He didn't answer a year of dua, He answered the one dua. All the rest of those dua go to cleansing your sins and to elevating your rank and to uh, extra compensation in the afterlife. I'm telling you, our way in this Dajjalic era, we're in a Dajjalic era. And what is Dajjalic? Ghafla, heedlessness of Allah and of the afterlife. And what does Allah always say? God and the last day, all the time. That's anything that distracts you from Allah and from the akhirah, it's darkness, right? And it's so important to realize that Dajjal, Shaitan, are not worried about the one who shouts loudest for Islam or against down with the Dajjal. He doesn't, that's not what he worries about. What he worries about is the one who prays and he makes dua. All right. And he observes the sharia, even if he's silent or even if he's 
muted, or even if he has no ability, no capacity, I mean, 99.9% of the Ummah have no capacity to say anything about this Dajjalic world. They're not in the position to do that. They wouldn't even know how to. What Dajjal, what is his kryptonite, and what is Iblis's kryptonite, is the Iman that's in your heart. Right? Which is not to say that we shouldn't always be forbidding wrong and commanding right. We should always be doing that. But the real crux of, of the light of Iman, it comes when you make dua, when you pray. There's an amazing story about Malik ibn Dinar. Way back in Basra, a long time ago, a third generation Muslim. That means his teacher studied under the Sahabi. Who was his teacher? Hassan al-Basri who was raised in the house of Umm Salama, wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Hassan al-Basri's mom was a servant. She used to work, do chores for Umm Salama. Okay? When she had a baby and she needed to work, she was a poor woman. So the wife of the Prophet, Umm Salama, said, give me the baby. I'll take the baby. I'll, I'll raise the baby. At night you pick him up. So she basically offered herself for babysitting, essentially. For, uh, for this baby. And that baby became Hassan al-Basri. No wonder he became Hassan al-Basri when the wife of the Prophet, Umm Salama, basically is his, his caretaker. Right? Took kindergarten and pre-K in the household of Umm Salama. When he grew up, she sent him off to be around Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib and Hassan and Hussein and Muhammad ibn Hanafiya and those Sahaba that were in Kufa. He never met the Prophet. Well, his disciple was Malik ibn Dinar. Now Malik ibn Dinar, something special about him, for the, all of his youth, was a complete sinner. He was, he was, he was a cop for the, for the Umayyad dynasty, and he was a drinker. He used to drink. No woman would marry him. No family. The fathers, when he would go propose for marriage, they all reject him. Okay? Uh, he, when it came time for him to marry, he, the only person he could marry was a prostitute. And he married her. And she stopped being a prostitute and they got married. Okay? His daughter died. He had a famous story. He, made his, he, he turned his life around and he became a disciple of Hassan al-Basri. When this happened, what he ended up doing is that he had a neighbor... He became the imam after Hassan al-Basri died. The neighbor came to complain to him and said to him, my daughter has died. Now this daughter was very unique. This, the, the neighbor of Hassan al-Basri, her daughter was said to be the prettiest woman in all of Basra. The prettiest woman in all of Basra. All right? She died. She was not a good person. She used to misuse the gift of beauty that Allah gave her. So when her mother buried her, or, 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 or after the burial, she saw her daughter in a dream, and this is very common. It's very common you're going to see people in dreams. Okay, I hope the battery doesn't die because I love this topic. My phone battery is about to die, unfortunately. But we'll go until it dies. She saw her daughter in a dream, being punished. All right? Being punished, being tortured in a pit of darkness and fire. She was so upset, she went to Hassan al-Basri, uh, uh, to Malik ibn Dinar. Malik ibn Dinar said, go and pray to Hajjud every night and make dua for her. So the mother did that. A few nights later, Malik ibn Dinar sees the dream, because sometimes you can see dreams for other people. He saw a castle in paradise that was his. He knew in his heart that it's his. He goes in, and he looks inside and he finds that girl wearing a crown of gold and sitting on a throne. Okay, And he said, what happened? We saw you in a pit of fire. She said, a man came to the graveyard and he recited 1,000 salawats on the messenger, peace be upon him. And he said, oh Allah, distribute this, reward of this to anyone who needs it in the graveyard. And he left. And she said, that it fell onto my grave. So in other words, the, du the dua caused her forgiveness. It caused this man to come in and bring this light and put out the punishment that she was facing. Because that's what dua does. And when the Prophet ﷺ said, nothing will benefit you except a good child, because the word walad in Arabic could mean the boy or the girl, a good child that prays for him, it's, it's, he said, a good child that prays for him, that's what benefits you in the afterlife, because mostly, in most cases, that's who prays for, for people, their children. But it means anybody who prays for them. 
this man, he had basically made a dua for them and sent this reward of salawats on the Prophet ﷺ and he said that it removed all of the punishment and Allah Ta'ala has elevated me because I died as a Muslim uh, into paradise. He went and he told the mother, right? Just goes to show you that when someone dies, oftentimes there's still a connection and we could still get news from them. Every time someone dies, I guarantee you, usually one or two nights, the loved ones get to see their state. Right? Usually, especially if it's a good state. Alright? So, uh, be, uh, because this battery is going to die, let's see if we can open this iPad and see if there... I don't know if I can actually access from the Instagram from the iPad to see what's going on here and to see if I can answer some of your comments or questions. Uh, I, I can't wait one... The day that I have an actual tech person to do all this stuff, right, would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, anyway, let me just look here and see if you guys have anything that you want to say or talk about. 